Hi, hello. Welcome back to Ultra Retrospective. If this is your first time here, the purpose of this little opinionated show of mine is to go back and revisit shows from the Ultraman franchise to see if they hold up or not. I've been going through this entire franchise since 2018, so it's always a little difficult to remember individual entries, so I want to preserve my thoughts on them in video format. Today's show stands out, however. A little history. The previous show, Ultraman Nexus, wasn't received terribly well on release. It was made for an older audience, and due to a variety of factors involving toy sales and viewership, it ended a whole story arc early. It's hard not to feel like a lot of the show was getting rushed through in that final episode. Without getting too deep into my thoughts on it, I thought it was a really great show, regardless of how abruptly it ended. With the themes it was tackling and the general tone of the show, I can see why it would be too alienating. I mean, Ultraman Cosmos was the show that came before it, and that one was very kid-friendly. It was clear that Tsuburaya felt the need to do a hard course correction with the next show, by making it more appealing to kids. But, in a smart move, it wasn't just for kids. That show ended up being Ultraman- Ultraman Max! Yeah, that. Like other shows made during Ultraman's Heisei era, Max is a standalone series, not taking place in any prior timeline. The show's attack team, Dash, was created in response to the appearance of giant monsters over the years. Nearly perishing after commandeering one of Dash's aircraft, it's a long story, social worker Kaito Toma is saved by Ultraman Max, and the two agree to unite against the kaiju and aliens threatening the planet. Kaito also joins Dash in the process, though he keeps his ability to turn into Ultraman a secret, as per usual. It's a familiar premise and a return to the strict Monster of the Week structure that Nexus had somewhat strayed from, but it's a welcome return because it's so well done here. Max does have the odd two-parter every once in a while, but for the most part it's back to business with the standalone episodes. The cast of characters in Dash are alright. They hit a lot of the same character archetypes I've seen in this series before, but they're endearing on their own for the most part and each have their moments to shine. Ellie is the standout member of Dash. She's an android who works as the team's data analysis. She's robotic and doesn't understand human emotion, but she slowly learns what it means to be human over the course of the series. Which includes a very strange episode with Pigmon. I transformed! I'm Pigmon! Whoa! As you may have noticed, I'm using clips from the dub. Which, yes, that exists, but I'll explain why later. Just know that I did go back and watch the show subbed for this rewatch. Think of it as stroking a monkey. Anyways, I also have to give a mention to Sean White, incredible name by the way, for being one of the rare Caucasian actors to appear as a regular supporting character in the show. It's always entertaining when a Japanese show has a wacky English-speaking character. Max also started the trend of paying tribute to the franchise's legacy, something that was fully realized with the next show, Mebius, being a full-blown sequel to the Showa era. But then the whole legacy thing got increasingly less special every time the same five Showa era kaiju appeared in a series made in the 2010s. But that's another conversation for later. From the sheer number of returning kaiju, the cameos from past Ultra series actors, the silhouette-styled opening, and Max himself being a buffer Ultra 7. But considering how long it had been since these monsters and actors appeared in anything, I thought it was welcome here. Keep in mind, I was watching this series chronologically. For me, it had been a while since I had seen any of these guys. So the return here felt fresh and exciting. And the show has a number of original kaiju and memorable episodes to help it stand on its own, even using those returning kaiju to tell good stories. It may have been just an attempt to win back an older audience, but it was a pleasant surprise when an old face showed up here. It's nice to see best character E-Day again, even if it's technically not the same character. The returning faces aren't exclusive to the human cast. Some of them even got a cool modern facelift. I love what they did with Eliking, but Pigmon is still pretty hard to love. I don't know. I've always thought this guy was kind of an ugly cute. It does get a memorably bizarre episode, though. Wait, is Pigmon a girl? Uh, don't know. Gomora is a friggin' genetically engineered bioweapon in this series, so that makes for a fun subversion when he starts doing wacky stuff. Tonally, the show is more lighthearted than the prior entry and that includes more comedy. 
some of it doesn't really work for me, but I found myself chuckling at a lot of it too. What are you doing? Really, the worst moments are with this guy, Alien Shaman. I have my tolerance for juvenile humor, but sometimes it can be too much. And that's what's simplistic. What is that sound design? Was that someone unzipping a jacket? And that's what's simplistic. Also, hang on. Ultraman Max exists as a show within Ultraman Max? The implications here are pretty bizarre. In fact, they do a meta thing more than once in this show. It's really weird. Anyways, the episodes of this show have consistently good pacing. They're surprisingly fast considering the show doesn't even have an ending sequence to pad out the runtime like other Heisei era shows. I think it's how much story is here between each eye catch. Sometimes the cold open goes on long enough for the intro to happen six minutes in, which I think helps with the perception of time. Now is as good a time as any to talk about the dub. Stop it! Stop playing! Get out of the way, old man! See, when I originally watched this show, it was on the Toku streaming service. Rest in peace, bozo. And the only version of the show they had was the dub. <laughs> at first, I thought this was going to be a detriment. And it was at points, considering how seriously some episodes intended to be taken. But I was surprised by how much I liked it. I'm afraid I have no interest in useless old fossils. <laughs> yes! We're gonna search for a Pigmon! I don't know if Omni Productions was still around at the time this show got dubbed, but it seems to have been dubbed in Hong Kong by the same stable of actors that were used in the Heisei and Millennium Godzilla films. So there are a number of familiar voices here. Those dubs, not really a fan of them. Why do you need to be fit when you're gonna make Godzilla disappear up his own butthole, huh? They really distract from the intended tone of those films. And Sony uses them as the basis for their crappy dub titles, so you can't even escape the changed dialogue in the original language. And while this Ultraman Max dub can be just as stilted, I get the sense that the voice actors were actually having fun here. It oddly kind of works. That's a big mon! I'm sure of it! <laughs> Sometimes I get a fan dubbers trying not to wake up their parents vibe from these deliveries. The Earth is such a beautiful planet. And so we, the Saran, have decided that this would make a perfect second home for all of us. We paints never work. It gets especially funny when an alien appears and they put on some silly voice filter. You are now the set But the voice actors still do an adequate job at getting the emotion across. Also, Ellie being a robot actually kind of justifies her stilted delivery. This is not high school. Please behave yourself. You said it, Ellie. So yeah, it's pretty cheesy but it really grew on me. Now, I won't say how you can watch this dub. As soon as I say where it is, it'll get taken down. Just know that it's out there and doesn't require a ton of hoops to jump through to find it. Super Aya and Mill Creek, as far as I know, sure as hell aren't going to try to preserve it in a physical format. I think people will accept me more as a girl than a talking lobster. On the subject of audio, Ultraman Max's soundtrack is serviceable. It's not a bad musical score, but outside of the opening theme and all the leitmotifs that come from that, nothing really stands out here. It's all kind of generic. I feel the need to bring this up because Nexus had a fantastic soundtrack, so if there's any element that doesn't quite live up to the prior show, it's that. There's a point where it straight up uses stock music. The track that plays when Max is fighting Zeton and King Joe is named Red Rum, and it's been used in a number of movie trailers. Universal Pictures presents Brendan Fraser, Rachel Weisz, John Hanna. Since I'm already talking about the Zeton episode, now is as good a time as any to say that Ultraman Xenon is the most superfluous Ultra in the entire franchise. At least as far as appearances in mainline shows go. He appears in like two episodes with no build-up to his arrival, outside of being name-dropped in the title cards after the opening. He gives Max a little trinket like the Ultra Bracelet, which helps him beat Zeton. Then he fucks off for the rest of the series until the very end. They were doing a Zafi thing with him being the commander or superior character, but unlike Zafi, Zenon hasn't really appeared in much afterwards. He left no lasting impression. Visually, he also kind of looks like a prototype for Mebius, so that only further pushes him into obscurity. Out of all the Ultra shows I've seen, I think Max might have the highest concentration of memorable episodes. 
a lot of these are bangers, and they would usually bring on someone notable to direct them. Shusuke Kaneko, the director behind GMK and the Gamera trilogy, directed a handful of episodes here, and one of his episodes starts like this. Godzilla is so strong! <laughs> and Mary is strong too! So yeah, that's pretty good. Even Steven Seagal's daughter appears in a supporting role, which is still such a weird factoid. Max also has the very rare Ultraman Christmas episode, and it ends on a heartwarming note. I know Japan doesn't celebrate Christmas the same way the West does, but as a Westerner, it's nice when they do an episode like this. The last time there was a Christmas episode was way back in Ultraman Taro, which wasn't necessarily a bad episode, but it featured a kaiju named Alien Terrorist, and his evil plan was to steal the Earth's oil. So yeah, it's nice that the most recent Christmas special wasn't that. There's also an episode that pays tribute to Ultra Q with a kaiju that looks Baragon-esque. You know, like the kaiju that used a redressed version of that suit. It even tries to dig and does a leaping move like Baragon, so that was fun to spot. The episode even has segments that use a style of presentation that directly references Ultra Q. Even Kenji Sahara and Yasuhiko Saijo come back for it. Oh, another thing, there's a part of this episode where they use music from Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's surreal, but kind of fitting, considering it's a throwback to that era of science fiction. I know I'm not really reviewing the episode and I'm just pointing out things I recognized, but as someone who has been watching this series for the past four years, I enjoyed all the easter eggs and callbacks. It's a pretty good episode. Of course, not every episode is a winner, but I don't think there are any I would call bad. Just some of them are kind of whatever. The Balton two-parter could have just been one episode. It kind of felt like it was tepidly moving along from one plot beat to the next. I do think it's cool how this episode and the Cosmos movie tried to redeem Balton by the end. It's like the writers were apologizing for that first Balton episode where Ultraman basically committed genocide against an entire race while they were sleeping. As a matter of fact, it was written and directed by the same two guys who did the original Balton episode. Giving closure to this race by not painting them all as evil is nice. And as far as I remember, this is closure. Balton hasn't been given a spotlight episode since Max. It's heartwarming with that in mind, but the two-parter is still kind of whatever. Shazam. The late Akio Jisoji made his final contributions to the franchise here, and they're certainly Jisoji episodes. I'm confused. Some of his most memorable, even. The first one, Butterfly Dream, is a unique meta-episode about the writer of an Ultraman Max episode switching places with Kaito, and the two have to work together to defeat the monster of the week, a characterless round blob the writer himself dreamt up. It's got the Jisoji trademark of having stage play elements with the spotlights and all the butterflies on poles flying around. It's effectively eerie, largely in part due to its cinematography, jarring juxtaposition of imagery with cuts spooky lighting and sound design. Very surreal and creepy episode, I liked it a lot. His second episode, The Untargeted Town, is a spiritual sequel to his Metron episode from Ultra 7. In it, a world-weary alien Metron plans to depart to space, but not before playing one last trick on humanity by exploiting its weakness to technology. It's hard to not just interpret the episode's message as phone bad, like it's saying that phones are the next tobacco addiction. You can't get more blunt than ear-blasting monkey mp3 jump scares. <laughs> but it's at least presented with Jisoji's typically bizarre camera work and soundscape. When viewed on a meta level, it really felt like Jisoji was saying goodbye here, with the direct references to the original Metron episode and the warehouse of suits Metron resides in. Not to mention, Metron and the policeman character wistfully reminiscing about the good old days. It's a good, albeit nihilistic, send-off to Jisoji's Ultraman tenure. I mean, Kaito doesn't really offer a counterpoint to any of Metron's musings about humanity. I think that's telling about the tone the director wanted to leave with. I don't know. Considering Twitter, maybe Jisoji was right. He just gave up on this planet. I flew home without a fuss. Even Takashi Miike directed a couple episodes. Yes. That Takashi Miike, and I want to put a spotlight on one of them, Miracle of the Third Planet. It's about the discovery of a giant white marshmallow kaiju named If. 
Dash makes the preemptive move, and that's where If's ability is revealed. If it's attacked, it changes its appearance, and it copies the attacker's moves, including Ultraman Max's. If is virtually indestructible. At the same time, a blind little girl's concert is cancelled because of If's rampage. This episode is genuinely moving. When I first saw it, I was kinda blown away. The apocalyptic and occasionally beautiful visuals are striking. The little girl's performance is heartbreaking. In the original language, of course. And the message the episode ends on is touching. On all levels of execution, this is one of my favorite Ultraman episodes. Potentially my all-time favorite. The other episode Mike directed is good too. It's probably more well-known because of how silly it is. But the one that came before it was more impactful, I think. Max is a show that strikes a balance of new and old, without feeling stale, paying tribute to the Showa era by bringing back old faces on both the cast and creative side of production, and homaging old storylines while bringing in guest talent with their own ideas. It doesn't consistently hit greatness. The comedy is hit or miss, some characters I straight up don't like, and the soundtrack could have been better. But a lot of my grievances are very minor in the overall scope of the show. It can be sincere, it can be cheesy, it can be goofy, it's everything I love about Ultraman in one show. There's a reason why I finished this show in like, five days on my first watch through. I loved it that much. I don't know if it's because it's sandwiched between two other really great shows, but I think Max is unfairly overlooked. I know, very humble to use myself as a source, but the Out of Context video I did on it has way less views than the Mebius one. Not only that, but Max as a character rarely gets acknowledged outside of his own show. He was a background character in the Mega Monster Battle movie, and the most he's gotten since is a decent Ultraman X episode and a minor role in the Ginga S movie. Considering his show's consistent quality, I think it deserves a look. If you've never seen an Ultra show, this is a good starter. And if you're only familiar with the modern stuff, then this is a good mid heisei era series to start with. Its episodes are well paced, it's got fun fight scenes, a decent cast, a good lineup of returning and new monsters, several noteworthy episodes, and it's one of the shorter entries in the franchise. Only 39 episodes. Check it out. It's one of my favorites. Hey, how's it going? Uh... I'm auditioning for the English dub of Ultraman Max, so as you can see, my voice has a filter on it. So I guess I'll just read some of my patrons this way. Ryan Santa Cruz, Avak Robot, Dante Infante, Ziggy Zigra, It's Code Z, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpsella. Thank you very much.